happening now, breaking news, no easy way out. President Trump says he's not ready to declare a national emergency at the border just yet, despite his threats. Why is he hesitating to pull the trigger on his most extreme option for funding his wall and potentially ending the government shutdown? No payday. Hundreds of thousands of federal workers are seeing a big fat zero on their pay stubs tonight as the shutdown is breaking records and inflicting a new level of pain and suffering. Spilling secrets. With Michael Cohen set to testify before Congress, we expect to learn new details about the president's alleged role in his former lawyer's crimes. Will Cohen open the door for testimony by Stormy Daniels and other blockbuster witnesses? And pulling out now, after weeks of confusion about the president's Syria policy, we're learning that the first stage of the U.S. military drawdown is now underway. We want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer. You're in the Situation Room. This is CNN Breaking News. We're following breaking news on the president backing off of a potentially desperate bid to get his border wall built as the government shutdown is about to become the longest in U.S. history. He says he won't declare a national emergency at the southern border so fast, acknowledging it would likely be challenged in the courts. Instead, he's sticking to his demand that Congress agree to spend billions of dollars on the wall. But tonight, the deadlock continues, taking a very painful toll on 800,000 federal workers. They're going without paychecks tonight for the first time since the shutdown began three weeks ago this hour. I'll talk with the New York Times columnist and author Thomas Friedman. And our correspondents and analysts are also standing by. But first, let's go to our chief White House correspondent, Jim Acosta. Jim, the president has been threatening this national emergency for days, but now he's saying not so fast. That's right, Wolf. Today he talked about the situation on the border as being a national emergency, a crisis and so on. But for now, the president says he's not declaring a national emergency so he can build his wall on the border. One thing that might be holding the president back, he conceded in front of reporters today, a national emergency declaration would likely be challenged in the courts. Part of what we've just finished. After hinting for days that he may declare a national emergency to force the government to construct his border wall, President Trump admitted there may be cracks in that plan. A wall of opposition could be looming, Mr. Trump said, in the courts. If they can't do it, if at some point they just can't do it, this is a 15-minute meeting. If they can't do it, I will declare a national emergency. I have the absolute right to do it. I'll be sued. It'll be brought to the Ninth Circuit, and then hopefully we'll win in the Supreme Court. Mr. Trump's hesitation comes as he now presides over what's about to become the nation's longest government shutdown, with 800,000 workers impacted, many going without paychecks this weekend. There are incredible people, the federal employees that we're talking about. But many of them agree with what I'm saying and what the people in this room who are experts are saying. They don't want to see people killed because we can't do a simple border structure. Democrats are accusing the president of putting his quest for a wall over the needs of federal employees. Today is the first day that uh, federal employees are getting these pay stubs with a big zero on them, even though as their pay stubs say zero, their bills keep uh, coming in. And we have the same uh, question uh, on the Senate floor. Why don't we do what's in our power to reopen the government? The president is continuing to hype the situation down on the border. Actually, you know, a lot of people don't like the word invasion. We have a country that's being invaded by criminals and by drugs. He tweeted the steel barrier or wall should have been built by previous administrations long ago. They never got it done. I will. Without it, our country cannot be safe. Criminals, gangs, human traffickers, drugs, and so much other big trouble can easily pour in. It can be stopped cold. But during his trip down to the border, one law enforcement official told him migrants are already digging tunnels under areas where walls exist. This is just a couple of miles from here, from where we're standing. <coughs> this is a tunnel. This is the second tunnel that recently that we have located. This is an area that we actually have wall. The president is being cheered on by fellow Republicans to take matters into his own hands, with Senator Lindsey Graham releasing a statement saying, Mr. President, declare a national emergency now. Build a wall now. 
But when President Obama used an executive action to shield immigrants from deportation, he was blasted by Graham and other GOP leaders. This is wrong, it's irresponsible, and will do damage to our efforts to fix a broken immigration system. This is a tremendous presidential overreach. I will try to defund the effort for him to go it alone. We will challenge him in court. Imposing his will unilaterally may seem tempting. It may serve him politically in the short term, but he knows it will make an already broken system even more broken. And he knows this is not how democracy is supposed to work. Despite a government shutdown that's now hurting American families and potentially damaging the economy, the president was joking Democrats can give him his wall, but call it something else. They can name it whatever they can name it, peaches. I don't care what they name it, but we need money for that barrier. The president didn't say just how long he's willing to let this government shut down, grind on, or what exactly will prompt him to declare a national emergency down on the border. For now, the president appears ready to let this shutdown continue until he finally gets his way. The president said Democrats, as you heard a few moments ago, can call his wall peaches. But at this point, lawmakers from both parties, Wolf, are treating this more like a lemon. Wolf. All right, Jim, thank you. Jim Acosta reporting now uh, that uh, President Trump has push the, the, the pause button on the declaring a national emergency. Let's get an update from Capitol Hill. Uh, is there any hint of hope, uh, any, any hope of a compromise to end this shutdown? We're joined by our congressional correspondent, Phil Mattingly. Phil, we heard the president say Democrats can call the wall whatever they want, even peaches, as you just heard, if they give them the funding for the wall. So what's the latest on Capitol Hill right now? Yeah, it's not the name, nor is it the material. It's the broader policy goal that Democrats are opposed to, have been opposed to, and say they will continue to oppose. But also you're hearing more and more for Democratic lawmakers, including Democratic leaders, that it's the strategy. They don't want to give in at this point because then the president would win, and then the president would possibly do this again anytime there's another funding deadline. Essentially, as one Democratic lawmaker told me earlier, you can't negotiate with terrorists. They're not calling the president a terrorist, but they're making the broader point that negotiating at any point on any level, giving any ground at all would incentivize the president to come back to this strategy later. You combine that with Republicans who, even though they are frustrated, even though they wish there was some pathway out of this, are not willing to leave the president behind, and you have a clear stalemate. Look, we've seen throughout the course of this week, Wolf, House Democrats have passed individual funding bills to reopen the agencies that are currently shuttered, but the dynamic on Capitol Hill remains the same. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader, has said he will not put anything on the Senate floor until the president signs off. The reason for that, I'm told, is twofold. First and foremost, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell thought he had an agreement with the White House before this shutdown started on a unanimous bill to reopen the government for a short period of time. Second off, he's reflecting his conference. When I talk to Senate Republican aides, they say the majority of the conference is still firmly behind the president. Politically, there's no incentive to buck the president. And so here we are at an impasse, about to set a record for the longest shutdown, people missing paychecks by the hundreds of thousands. Congress is currently adjourned. They won't be back till Monday. Right now, nobody involved thinks there's any hope for a deal anytime soon, Wolf. If the president were to declare a national emergency, Phil, will the government uh, reopen immediately? I think this is a really important point. There's no switch that just gets flipped. And when I talk to aides who are involved, including aides who are in regular communication with the White House, in terms of what would the next steps be if the government did declare a national emergency? And keep in mind, the White House was briefing people on Capitol Hill about the ideas they were considering on that front. What I am being told right now is the White House has not given them the next steps. They've not told them, OK, if the president decides to do this, we will accept this package of bills or this short term extension of funding to immediately reopen the government. So essentially, even if the president president decides to declare a national emergency, Capitol Hill will still have to figure out the legislation to reopen the government. And as long as everybody still remembers the president deciding to change course, not sign the stopgap bill in December, everybody is very wary about moving forward on any possible option. So keep in mind, as this national emergency, while it seems to be put off for now, when it or if it comes back to the table as this continues to drag on, it is not an immediate switch to flip the government back on. There is still legislative work to do on Capitol Hill legislative work that at this point hasn't been outlined as to what would be acceptable, what would get the government back open, and what would get paychecks, again, flowing to federal workers. Very well, important point indeed. Phil Mattingly, uh, up on Capitol Hill, thanks very much. Uh, joining us now, the New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman is the author of the very important best-selling book, Thank You for Being Late. Since, Tom, thanks very much for coming in. Great to be here. So 800,000 federal workers are suffering right now 
no paycheck, their families are suffering. What's your big picture take now on the state of the country, uh, the United States, uh, right now in 2019? Well, you know, Wolf, uh, we talked uh, about a year and a half ago, and I made the point, I quoted my friend Dosai, and he said, we have a president now who has formal authority, but no moral authority. And the point I made then was, when you have a president with no moral authority, when it comes to a crisis, when he has to look in the camera and say, trust me, believe me, we need X, we need Y, we need to invade here, it's really going to matter. And I think we're at that point. Um, you, you heard in, in your correspondence report, no one trusts this man. No one believes a word out of his mouth anymore. He had to deal with Mitch McConnell uh, you know, to, to open the government. And I think we're at a point, especially for the next two years, where if we do face a crisis, what does it mean to have a crisis when you have a president who has no moral authority? We've never been there. If there's a real national security right. threat, exactly. even a war, you can't believe a word out of his mouth. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a serious problem. Uh, it, what we're seeing from the president right now, and you've watched him very closely, is this typical Trump? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that you know, it's typical in this way. Well, we actually have a serious immigration problem. We have an immigration problem because for the last... For the 50 years after World War II, well, this is a point I made in my book, um, it was really easy to be an average country. There were superpowers giving you money, climate change was moderate, populations were under control, and China was not in the World Trade Organization. So everybody could be in the textile business. What's changed over the last decade and a half is it's actually now harder to be a country. They're being hammered by climate change. No superpower wants to touch them because all you win is a bill. Populations are out of control, and China now can compete with anything they sell. So the weakest countries are actually now either fraying or they're actually imploding. And, and for our hemisphere, they're in Central America. It's Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. That's where this problem is coming from. These countries are falling apart. So if you actually had a comprehensive strategy, what would you do? You'd have a population control strategy, you'd have a climate strategy, and you'd have a security strategy. If the president were actually to come with that strategy, hey, I'd support that. I'd say, yes, we need border security. We also need these to address these other issues because Wolf, these countries, what we're going to witness, a lot more countries are going to fall apart. We've seen it in Africa and the Middle East. They've been flocking to Europe. We've seen it in our hemisphere. This is a serious problem. We do not have a serious man diagnosing and leading us out of this The problem. president's world clearly changed on January 3rd when the Democrats became the majority in the House of Representatives. They won 40 seats in the election. Do you think President Trump fully appreciates the enormity of what he's facing right now from Congress? No, and you, you've heard this in, in all your reporting, Wolf. Um, he's never been here before. I mean, he enjoyed the first two years, a very unique thing for a president. He had the, the White House, he had the Supreme Court, he had the, 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 uh, the House, and he had the Senate. And now suddenly, uh, he doesn't have the House, and uh, it's a whole new world for him, and he's got to, got to navigate it, and he, he does not have the skill to do that. And he doesn't have the team to do it. Wolf, he started with the B team. A lot of the B team left. Now he's got the C team. And, and if we face a crisis with a president who no one believes, who's surrounded by a C team in a dysfunctional White House, God save us. You've got a lot of members of the cabinet who are acting secretaries uh, as opposed to full secretaries. They're, 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 they're filling jobs yeah. because others have left, including some very sensitive yeah. positions. And we have key ambassadorships. I know they've appointed an ambassador to Saudi Arabia, but I don't know that he's on the job yet. I mean, for two years, we've gone with no ambassador for a pretty important Why country. is that? Um, I think Trump actually believes, first of all, that he can do everything. Um, he or Jared Kushner, they can handle Saudi Arabia. And, and I don't think he has a real respect for government. He, when he gets in trouble, he impugns them as the deep state. He doesn't appreciate that these institutions, well, if they're what make us unique as a country. And he, he didn't respect them when he was a businessman. He tried to, to evade them. Um, and he certainly doesn't respect them as a leader. Has he finally met his match at Nancy Pelosi? I, I think he certainly met a match in Nancy Pelosi. She's a serious person. But I think the deeper problem, Wolf, is that he's told one too many lies. I don't know whether it was line number 6,000 or 7,000. The Washington Post has been keeping a tab. But what I felt that we're in a moment now where people simply don't believe a word out of his mouth. When he can stand up and say, look, I never said Mexico would pay for the wall. I mean, we're, we're, we're through the looking glass, Wolf. Um, we, we have a core problem. We have a president without shame who is backed by a party without spine that is supported by a network called Fox News without integrity. And a president without shame backed by a party without spine and a, and a network that amplifies it without integrity. And we face a crisis. Fasten your seatbelt. Let me read a couple sentences from a column you recently wrote uh, in the New York Times. Quote, 
I believe that the only responsible choice for the Republican Party today is an intervention with the president that makes clear that if there is not a radical change in how he conducts himself, and I think that is unlikely, the party's leadership will have no choice but to press for his resignation or join calls for his impeachment. Uh, do you see any sign at all that serious numbers of Republicans are beginning to think along those lines? I don't, and it's it's really sad. Um, uh, this is a party that is simply laid down for a demented man. Um, and they've been laying down for anyone who would energize their base, going back to Sarah Palin and then the Tea Party, and now it's Trump. Um, and somehow, as a country, we've managed to stumble forward. But um, we're, we're, really, um, uh, we're, we're really risking our, 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 our luck here. I mean, how long this can go on? Because we have a disturbed man as President Wolf. I mean, that, that's very clear. And we have a party that is not ready to stand up to it. And what worries me is now we're threatening our institutions. Look what he, look what he did uh, describing the judges in our judicial system as they're Obama judges. And thank God. John Roberts stood up and said, no, there aren't Obama judges and, and Bush judges. They're, they're just judges. You know, look what he's been doing with the military, saying that the people who are uh, out of work now, government workers, well, they're mostly just Democrats. These are our institutions. What makes us unique as a country, Wolf, is that we have a judiciary. We have a nonpartisan military. We have a, a, a true state, not, not some nefarious deep state. And the world envies those institutions. Why do you think all those people are lining up to get into our country? Because they want to be in a place that has those kind of institutions. And that's precisely what this president is attacking. And that is a threat. The biggest crisis we have right now is in the Oval Office. We have a president who is, uh, does not appreciate the institutions that make our country unique. Is the Republican leadership, from your perspective, afraid of the president? Well, they're, they're, these are people who seem to be so obsessed with their $175,000 a year job and free parking at National Airport that they will not stand up and actually speak out, not against the, four Democrats or some, but on behalf of institutions. When the president embarrasses someone like Defense Secretary Mattis the way he did, um, you know, when, when, he, when he lies day after day and you as a party say nothing, what do you think is the corrosive impact of that over time? What did you think of the president's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria, the way he handled it, uh, and of course the resignation that resulted in the Defense Secretary James Mattis? Look, there is a case, Wolf, for actually withdrawing from Syria and withdrawing from Afghanistan. But what would I have done? I would have the art of the deal. I would have come to the Russians and the Syrians and the Iranians and say, well, maybe you want us out, but here's the conditions we need. I wouldn't have just pulled out. I, I wouldn't have just moved the embassy to Jerusalem and not asked for something in return from Netanyahu or, 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 or the Palestinians. Uh, I, I mean, this is the problem with Trump. He's an ignoramus, okay? He doesn't understand the, sophistic, the, the subtleties of any of these policies, so he keeps giving stuff away. And that's really what's, what's scary to me. With Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, he gave him a complete pass. Well, the choice was not just give him a pass or break relations with Saudi Arabia. You could have made demands on him. He keeps giving stuff away because he doesn't understand things. Uh, do you see any prospect that it's going to change? I, I see no prospect of it whatsoever. I think it's only going to get worse. I think the next two years, Wolf, are going to be one of the most destabilizing and unnerving times in our history, and for you and me, in our journalism careers. How, how do you think he's going to respond uh, on February 7th when Michael Cohn, his former lawyer and fixer, goes before the House Oversight Committee and testifies, presumably for hours, uh, and makes very, very serious allegations, potential allegations, that the President of the United States was engaged together with him in crime? You know, it, it's so hard to tell, but he's, he's, he's so adept, Wolf, at, at bald face lying, that he's, he's capable of saying anything. I, I, I can't see him having some you know, moral crisis over it. I, 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 he'll just tell another lie. When, and, the, when the world, and you, you, know, you travel all over the world, you're a foreign affairs columnist, uh, when the world is watching what's going on in the United States right now, friends of the United States, allies of the United States in Europe and elsewhere, what are they thinking? What they're thinking is, Wolf, that you know, America is the world. We are the tent pole that holds up the world. We're the people who who invest in things even when we don't get an immediate payoff in order to, to promote global stability that ultimately is to our great benefit. They have never, most of them have never seen an America like this. 
uh, with a president who doesn't appreciate allies, a president who does not manifest the very values that America um, uh, uh, that it makes it makes America so attractive for them, uh, and uh, and a president who simply his word is in not even remotely his bond, and so they're all basically they're, they're all adrift. It's not like China is going to lead the world. It's not like Russia is going to lead the world. What happens when we don't lead, Wolf, is that nobody leads. You have any confidence in any of the president's top staff, his senior advisors, members of the cabinet, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, for example? No, none whatsoever. I think Pompeo is in a race with Tillerson for who is the all-time worst Secretary of State, and, and Pompeo seems to be uh, nosing him out. You think that Pompeo is a worse Secretary of State than well, Rex Tillerson? I just read his speech from the Middle East. If you think, the one he delivered in Cairo. The one, the one he state. delivered in Cairo. You know, if you think your job as, as Secretary of State is to go to the Arab world, um, uh, a dump on, a piss on the previous president uh, while you're there, and proclaim that you figured it all out because you figured out that the really right U.S. policy is to support every Arab tyrant who has in jail thousands of not Islamic radicals, but young democracy advocating people, particularly in a country like Egypt. All right. If you think that's like the most brilliant policy and that we're not going to pay for that down the road, then you're a complete idiot. Yeah, I was sort of surprised that <laughs> he went after President Obama. Uh, Obama. I could see him doing it here in the United States, he said, but politics were supposed to stop at one point at the Congress. water's edge. And to praise Sisi, and we figured it out. We figured out that Iran is the bad guy and that the, the, uh, these Arab tyrants are the good guys. So we're just gonna support them all along. And all these Arab youth who have always looked to America, you know, to be the voice and beacon of democracy and freedom. What do you think they're thinking? And how do you think that's gonna work out for all of them in jail when they get out of jail? With his base though, you know, the, 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 those who, who really loved the, the president, President Trump, uh, he's still very, very popular with that hardcore Republican conservative base. Well, you know, I, I, I can't explain uh, all of it. I've always felt, Wolf, that his base actually hates the people who hate Trump more than they care about Trump or his specific policies. Um, I think there's a lot of resentment out there at, at, you know, at elites and different people. And also, in fairness to that base, I think there's a lot of people who are living in this moment of acceleration against what my book is about, and they find this moment very disorienting. And so a president comes along and says, I can stop the winds of change. The wall is a metaphor for a lot of things, not just you know, the border and immigration. It's I can stop the winds of change. I, I can see how that appeals to some people. They're very disoriented. The, the fact is, though, he's selling them snake oil. So where is this all heading? Uh, you know, because within the next few weeks or maybe in a, a couple of months or so, Robert Mueller is going to come out uh, with his report. You hear the president say almost on a daily basis, no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. Where is this heading? I think it's heading for a constitutional crisis, Wolf. Um, a constitutional crisis in which um, uh, people like uh, John Roberts, the Supreme Court, um, the, Supreme Court uh, Chief uh, the Chief Justice, and people like ex-President Obama and ex-President Bush working together, uh, as one team, the three of them, I think, are going to have to play a very important role to speak up in a nonpartisan way, to, to, to present a nonpartisan front, I think, to defend and protect the Constitution. So when you say a constitutional crisis, explain what you mean by that. Well, I, I, I think that um, uh, we're going we're gonna to probably, as a result of Mueller, uh, have charges against the president that are uh, certainly going to uh, stimulate some people to want to bring about an impeachment. God knows what kind of things, Mueller, I've been watching your show this afternoon, the, 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 the kind of collusion that might be involved, the, the kind of simply illegality that Trump may have been involved in. Who knows what happens when we get his tax returns. This is going to be a gigantic mess, Wolf. And um, uh, it's going to affect the authority of the president. And I think that in this moment, we're going to so badly need nonpartisan people who stand up for American institutions and values and that's why I'm glad Obama stayed out of it. I'm glad President George W. Bush has stayed out of it. I have such respect for John Roberts, so he spoke up to defend the nonpartisanship of the courts. I think these people um, who uh, are, are, have been acting in this, trying to act in a nonpartisan way, they're going to become so important, Wolf, as we enter this crisis. Because so you think we will gonna, actually hear from them? And I think we will hear from them um, because we, we are going to so badly need people who are ready to stand up for what makes us unique as a country, the values, okay, and the institutions, because that's what's going to be required, because I think they are going to be threatened. This is a man who will burn down anything and everything to save himself. We have already seen that.
Tom Friedman is the New York Times columnist, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, the author of the important book. Thank you for being late. Uh, you weren't late here today. Thanks for showing up on and wore a tie. <laughs> and you wore a tie. You looked good. Tom Friedman, thanks very much for thanks. coming in. Come Appreciate a long it. way since both of us were White House correspondents <laughs> during the first term of the Bill Clinton Absolutely. administration. Spent a lot of quality time uh, in thanks, those Tom. days. Thanks very much for coming in. We're going to have much more on all of the breaking news, including Michael Cohen's upcoming testimony before Congress, the secrets about President Trump that he... We're following breaking news on the shutdown standoff as President Trump decides not to declare a national emergency at the southern border, at least not right now. As this crisis drags on, Mr. Trump is trying to downplay the potential damage he may face next month when his longtime lawyer, Michael Cohen, publicly testifies before Congress. But Cohen has years of dirt on his former boss and an ax to grind. That is clear. Let's bring in our crime and justice reporter, Shimon Prokopas. Shimon, uh, CNN has learned that Cohen, what, is now ready to talk. We're, we're, we've got some information Sorry, yeah. openly about several sensitive, very sensitive subjects, including the hush money, money payments, uh, the, uh, the Trump organization, even the president's family. Yeah, and this is by... All accounts is going to be a very big day, historical, of course. Uh, and really what we're seeing is Michael Cohen is ready to go in and take down the president. Uh, quite simply, uh, I think he has felt wronged by what the president has done to him. He has supported and protected this president. That's no longer going to happen. Uh, and from everything that we're hearing, that he's prepared to go in and talk about the history, uh, certainly of these payments, the hush payments, how it started, who started it, how the president directed him to make these payments. And we're going to get really an inside look, I think, if he's asked these questions by members of Congress about how everything went down, who directed it, how the payments were made, who came up with the plan to do this. You know, I think for people, what they need to keep in mind here, and as the Department of Justice and the FBI has said this in court documents, this was almost uh, kind of a fraud on our election uh, because they hid. The purpose of these payments was to hide this relationship with these women. And so that's a big deal. Certainly the Department of Justice felt that it was a big deal. Michael Cohn pleaded guilty and has admitted to all of this. It's going to be a devastating day uh, for the president. And this hearing could go on for days. We don't know that there's any limits. The one thing that there is going to be some limits on is Russia in terms of how much he can talk about Russia because it appears the Mueller investigation may stay, may still be ongoing and therefore he may be limited. But really... Every, from everything we know right now, the president's biggest risk and everything right now is with these hush payments. We don't yet know enough about Russia to see or to say where his exposure is in that case. The hush, hush money payments uh, to Karen McDougal, is right. Daniels. Uh, and remember, Michael Cohn spent a decade plus working as a fixer and a lawyer uh, to Donald Trump. So he, he clearly knows a lot. Yeah. And, and in terms of the organization, also, there's going to be a lot of information, certainly about in the, Trump the Trump organization. Oh, yeah. All right. Shimo, thank you very much. Uh, there's more news we're following. President Trump backing away from, a, from declaring a national... The breaking news tonight, President Trump's sharp change of tone on his border wall after days of threatening to declare a national emergency to get the funding Congress won't give him. He's now saying... He's not ready to act so fast, uh, calling it, quote, the easy way out. He also admitted an emergency declaration would likely face some significant court challenges. Let's dig deeper with our correspondents and our analysts. And Crystal, let me play a clip for you. Uh, I moderated a re Republican presidential mm -hmm. debate back in 2016, and I had this exchange with Donald Trump when it came to his demand that Mexico pay for the wall. Yep. If you don't uh, get an actual check from the Mexican government for eight or 10 or $12 billion, whatever it will cost, how are you going to make them pay for the wall? I will, and the wall just got 10 feet taller, believe me. It's got 10 feet taller. Uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, I remember, I didn't work here, but I remember watching that debate and thinking, well, he didn't totally answer Wolf's question. Never in my mind did I think that we would be having, you know, two years on a debate that Donald Trump says he never said Mexico would be paying for the wall because he said it so many times. That 10 feet higher line was one of his favorites. Got to rise out of the crowd there. Got to rise out of the crowds when he was on the campaign trail. Look, this is someone we know who tends to try to rewrite both long past history and recent history. He's doing a little bit of both here. 
Uh, I'm fascinated that Donald Trump says that, that it's too soon to declare this, that, you know, it's not the best option to declare a state of emergency, candidly, because where we are today in this legislatively in trying to solve this shutdown is nowhere. I mean, we're nowhere better than we were the day the government shut down. So you would think sometime in those interesting 20 plus days, a if there was a better idea, it would have emerged. It hasn't. I thought everything was pointing toward him declaring a state of emergency. Him saying no now puts us back at square one with no idea. Because he says, Pamela, that uh, he doesn't want to take the easy way out and simply declare a national emergency. Yeah, you're, you're seeing him back away from that. And there are a couple of reasons. One, he actually said today and that he knows it would be immediately challenged in the courts. But also some of his conservative allies have been telling him on the airwaves and personally uh, that they don't want him to do it because they think it'll set a bad precedent mm -hmm. for when Democrats take over, then they'll just do the same on Democratic agenda items. Um, and so now they're just sort of back to square one, as you said, no clear path ahead. And sources are telling me and my colleague Sarah West would that the White House has actively been looking at other places to get money, like the civil civil forfeiture fund. Um, we've talked about disaster relief funding, looking at whether they can take funding there, because the president has sort of backed himself into a corner here where there just are no good options at this point. And frankly, he does own the shutdown. He's on record saying it. Mm -hmm. He yep. may not want to. He may want to put it on the Democrats, but he's the president. Yep. Where do you see this heading? Uh, that's the million dollar question, Wolf, because Democrats have said they're not giving the president any money for the wall. The president said he is getting his money for the wall. And that's been the entire story of this shutdown. Uh, both sides have stayed in their corners and there's no one meeting in the middle. Of course, as you alluded, Pam, Democrats have all the leverage here. This is President Trump's shutdown, uh, and they believe they have the upper hand politically and no incentive uh, to meet him and compromise. And so for as long as Democrats believe they don't have reason to compromise and the president believes he is winning this politically as well, we're going to have this stalemate. And don't underestimate, sorry, Pam, just quickly, don't underestimate the fact that the longer it goes, to Rebecca's point, the longer it goes, the harder it becomes. I would mm -hmm. compare it to waiting in line at Disney World, okay? If you wait five minutes in line for a two-hour line, your willingness after five minutes to cut bait is not too high. You, okay, well, we can leave. You haven't invested that much in the line, right? Well, you wait an hour and 45 minutes in that line, you're definitely waiting, even if it's a three-hour line, because you're already in line that long. This is 21 days. It's going to be 24, 25 by the time there's even the conversation legislatively. So getting 30 days, 35 days, 40 days, both sides get more and more entrenched because the stakes just get higher. And, mm -hmm. and I just talked talking to White House officials, behind the scenes there is a lot of concern, especially today where the shutdown is poised to be the longest in history but also this is the day workers are not getting their yes. paychecks mm. and sources i'm talking to in the white house say we believe we're losing this battle politically there's 800, a lot of concern. federal workers yeah. won't get a paycheck today and they will suffer their families will suffer uh, the enormous the enormous uh, problem you know joey let's talk about uh, the president if he decides to declare a national emergency he said it would go to the Ninth Circuit, he might lose in the Ninth Circuit, but eventually it would wind up in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, legally speaking, where is this heading? Well, put it this way. Well, first, let's talk about uh, the hypocrisy and then let's address the issue of the law. There has to be one standard and that standard has to apply to everything, right? You can't attack Obama if you're Lindsey Graham and you're Mitch McConnell talking about unitary action and unilateral action, presidential overreach. But then when it comes to your party, it's perfectly acceptable. That's what, make pe that's what makes people roll their eyes about politics, the hypocrisy. On the issue of the law, I'm one that believes that a national emergency should be a national National emergency, right? It's, I'm, I don't question the president's authority to do it. I question the rationale upon which it would be based. And that's what the court challenge would be based on. By analogy, the president had the authority to fire Comey, but what was his intention in doing that? You don't declare national emergencies because you don't get your way, because you don't get your wall. You want to raid funds from other sources so that you can say that, you know, you're the big person in the room. You have the executive authority. There has to be some rational basis attached to it. 
And so, yes, there will be a challenge. And that challenge, as I mentioned, won't be predicated upon executive authority. It'll be predicated upon whether there was a rational and reasonable basis for him to take that action. And if it's such an emergency, why hasn't it been taken as of yet? And it does set a dangerous precedent indeed. And so I do see it going to the Supreme Court. And I do believe that the Supreme Court will analyze it, not consistent with whether they're Republican or whether they're Democrat, to quote, right, Judge Roberts, but consistent with whether it is lawful and appropriate. Very quickly, uh, because uh, you're getting some new information, Pamela. Michael Cohen, the testimony he's going to be delivering next month. That's right. This is going to be getting everyone's <laughs> attention when he testifies. Of course, the, the president's longtime fixer, a lawyer, going to be testifying on the, to the Oversight Committee. Uh, those expecting him to reveal lots of details on Russia are going to be disappointed, though. We are told by sources, me and my colleague, Gloria Borger, uh, that while he will stay away from talking about Russia, Michael Cohen is expected, though, to talk about the president and his role in making those those hush money payments and how the election factored into that. Also, the Trump organization and the Trump kids. So uh, we are told through sources that he is willing to talk about those things. This is Michael Cohen's opportunity to come back and really go up against the president in a public forum. The president's not going to be happy uh, during no. those hours and hours of televised uh, testimony. Everybody stick around. We'll have more on the breaking news.